reversed. Greetings, I'm Shad, and in this episode of Fantasy Rearmed, I want to do a deep dive on what unfortunately has been an underappreciated character class in my own regard. I have disregarded the Ranger too much in the past, but as I've really looked at what the roles of an adventurer would be, and also the historical precedent for different classic kind of adventuring roles, the Ranger actually ends up being near the top of one of the more functional and practical roles or character classes in classic medieval fantasy. You see, in the past, I kind of looked at the Ranger as a bit of a poor man's fighter, or knight or whatever's where you didn't get as many options with the armor that you wear, and a lot of the other features you could kind of get through other characters. Now, my main, you know, uh, like familiarity with Dungeons and Dragons is 3rd edition and 3.5. And so in those editions, you could easily gain skills, like, like certain actual tracking skills and other abilities that were more identified with other character classes from another. So if you went a fighter, you could easily train up in the bow just as much as a ranger would and get certain tracking feats. And the only things you couldn't really get was like the favoured enemy stuff. I don't know how they did in 4th edition. Even though I've heard good things about 5th edition, I'm not sure if you could still do that. But because of that, some of the features of the ranger became a little redundant. Yet, this is the thing. When I actually have looked at the best weapons an adventurer would, you know, would want to take with them uh, and other things like that, you can check out the videos there. I find interesting, like this is one of my favourite loadouts here. If I was an adventurer, these are my options. Definitely a longbow, like ranged weapon is almost uh, like a necessity, and longbow uh, is faster to, you know, reload than a crossbow, and the damage is vicious and powerful. And then I went with a really big two-handed sword, just right there. And of course something like a dagger as well, then you got your arrows here, and you will notice that uh, the bow, my, my longbow, is hanging on a nail catch attachment to my back scabbard. And so I can easily draw my bow out really quickly, shoot it. The nail catch is an attachment that uh, I came up with that is really functionally effective. I've got a whole video on it that uh, enables you, because one of the problems is like, how would an adventurer carry a bow with them? That easy, and it works really, really well, and can work in conjunction with my back scabbard, and so I can draw e either one out at it in a moment's notice. And so, an adventurer, uh, I actually feel this is, would be really functionally uh, practical, and uh, it works in real life. And so, the, this is kind of the loadout that I've been experimenting to see what would my loadout be as an adventurer. And uh, oddly enough, when I pick my favourite loadout, it's like, huh. It's got a bit of familiarity or similarity with certain classical ranger loadouts. Like, I'm not wearing the heaviest armor because I want to be able to travel in it. And uh, I'm not, you know, shields would be too cumbersome because this is the thing about adventuring. Most of it would be traveling. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that a lot of people miss about adventuring. And so if you were to take that into account, the length of travel, like Lord of the Rings, okay? Most of the things that the heroes do in Lord of the Rings is traveling, <laughs> and uh, the fighting is few and far between. And so, if you're going to kill yourself because you've got too much stuff to carry, or your travel takes far too long, to the point where the forces of Mordor invade all the lands and you couldn't get to Mount Doom soon enough because you're lugging around too much inconvenient crap, well, the loadout and the type of stuff you take with you is very important. I've done a video on backpacks as well, and uh, the kind of, there's a lot of interesting takeaways with that video. I would want to avoid a backpack, and so pouches. Look at all the pouches I got here, and so yeah, it's very close to the ranger type loadout, and so the classic ranger actually fits the uh, tasks you would do as an adventurer, the travelling side, far more practically than any other class. But the thing is, that doesn't really come into gameplay too much, because when we play D&D or role-playing games or whatever, we like to skip over the travelling and get to the exciting action, and then everyone wants to go a knight, or a fighter, or a wizard, or a rogue and stuff. In my own experience in D&D, the ranger is probably the least used character class that I've ever seen played in my own groups. I'm sure there are exceptions. I know there are guys watching this saying, but this is my favourite class, I always go the ranger! This is my anecdotal experience, alright? So perhaps I'm wrong, perhaps there are groups that just love the ranger to death. But 
this video is going to not only uh, explain the historical basis, because there's actually more foundation, historical foundation and practicality for the ranger role in history than a lot of other classic fantasy roles. And then once we talk about the precedent for them, I want to explore what really would be the best weapons for a ranger. Now, you think you might know it. And uh, take away, yes, of course, the bow is like totally up there. But in terms of their melee weapon, I have come to a conclusion that I don't think you're going to... I didn't expect this. And it's awesome. And so I really, I'm excited to share with you what the best melee weapon would be for a ranger. But first, historical precedent. The ranger, as a role or a job, technically still exists. We have park rangers, all right? But we also have army rangers as well. And this is an interesting kind of dichotomy where the role of a ranger is very much wilderness associated, you know, looking after a forest or anything, but it's also combat associated. That's really interesting. So where do we get the two? Well, the original, one of the original historical origins of the ranger comes from the medieval period instituted by William the Conqueror. Originally called under foresters, they were instituted by William the Conqueror to protect the vert and venison. I don't know what vert means, but venison is specifically deer. Now we know in many instances, it was illegal for certain groups of people to hunt deer. You have to understand that, that this wasn't a universal thing that always exists in every part of the medieval period and every time of the medieval period. But there were specifically royal forests where the king and also lords, so if a lord had his own domain, they wanted the deer, the venison for themselves and they didn't want them to be hunted to the point where they weren't in the forest anymore. And so they said, no, it's left to us, okay? Of course, the king had the widest range of, you know, land to be able to seclude that privilege to himself, and so there were royal forests. Except, how would you police that? How could you actually police a forest? This is where the underforesters came in, or the original classic rangers. They had an interesting kind of type of law enforcement role to make sure the king's law was obeyed in the furthest reaches of his forests. So there is kind of like a combat role associated, but not really, it's more like law enforcement. But if they ever needed to enforce the law, they would need to be have the means to do so, and so, that's where the kind of combat part comes in. And then there is that kind of stewardship association with their role as well, because they had certain, you know, obligations to make sure the forest was in the right order for the king as well. And so you actually see a bit of a, the original thing is a bit of a combination between the forestry ranger and the army ranger, almost into one. The concept of a fully dedicated military ranger type role, well, actually came around in different parts in history. One example is actually during early American colonization history, where certain parts of the frontier needed to be patrolled between the different forts and stuff like that when America first started to be settled. And so they created a ranger corps and the kind of role of the ranger was to be a full military soldier, yet their unique role was actually traveling through wilderness and patrolling the wilderness uh, specifically. And so what's interesting about the Ranger is that we see combinations of law enforcement, military capacity, combat capacity, but one of the key defining features for the historical Ranger role is the ability to travel through wilderness, forest, okay? Not just, you know, hills like this, but actual thick forest. And not only that, not only travel, the capacity to survive without too much difficulties. They needed to be able to hunt and live off the land as they traveled and to be fully self-sufficient. And so we have elements of survival. We have elements of being able to traverse and travel independently on your own, not relying on horses or other things like that. Maybe you, sometimes you take a horse with you. And also elements of combat and law enforcement all associated with the historical ranger. Adapting this to fantasy can be kind of interesting because there are obviously the people in the past who had all the skills that say a ranger would have, but they wouldn't call themselves rangers. Historically, ranger was actually a role or a station someone designated you as based on your occupation. And so you would be an underforester or ranger, which it came to be known for in the medieval time when you actually were given the role or occupation to do so. Same if you were a military ranger. That was it. Yet in fantasy, anyone can just be a ranger. 
So perhaps with fantasy, you could employ that. And in some examples of fantasy properties, they've done that. An example is a Song of Ice and Fire series, Game of Thrones, where you have the Night's Watch. There is a ranger core in the Night's Watch. And this is one of the most apt kind of translations of the concept of a ranger into a fantasy property that's done really, really well to the concept and idea of what a ranger is. The rangers travel beyond the wall into the wilderness. That's their job. And it is a wilderness. And so a core defining feature of these soldiers is being able to survive some of the most hellish conditions you can imagine. And so they are considered the rangers. And so that works really well. But there is another classic ranger in one of the most iconic fantasy series ever, Lord of the Rings. Aragorn himself, they are called the Dunedain Rangers. And so one of the other ways you could adopt this ranger concept into fantasy is that there is a task that needs to be done that everyone kind of is aware of, and sometimes it could be supported by the crown or anything like that, but say there's a monster that is in, a, in the wilderness and uh, everyone knows these monsters need to be kept in check and you need to be able to traverse the wilderness to do it. And so people who take up that mantle or role themselves, and it could be people who are trained up specifically by masters who want to do it, but I'm trying to give you an example of where you have a decentralized idea of a ranger, where you don't need a lord saying, I need you to be my ranger. Not a scout, not a soldier, but I know you can track, I know you can travel, you're going to be my ranger, where this is someone just saying, I want to be a ranger for X, Y, Z reasons and fulfilling the same tasks or roles that a ranger would generally do without being given those tasks or roles by a higher authority. And it could be protecting an area, but, but for it to be clearly a ranger, it needs to be a very difficult wilderness for people to just travel, move through, and even live through. Because that's the key defining thing. And it would require some type of martial training and capacity as well, which is why this wilderness might have bandits or monsters that you need to be ready to deal with and then so if you cover those two key kind of features you would be filling the role of a ranger and if it's just for the good of the land and you're not doing it for a king you could still be called a ranger and perhaps that's fill me in the comments because uh, i'm not too familiar with the uh, role and necessity of the dunedain rangers that aragon is a part of and uh, if they're organized by a higher authority if they're just they're there but aragon in terms of his um abilities, his ability to travel and his skill sets, if he fulfills the roles of a ranger as well. And so they can be uh, incorporated into fantasy very seamlessly. And in actual fact, if you look to the uh, precedents in history, definitely like, like a king who has a, like a forest or a wilderness that is uh, too hard for him to uh, have complete, I guess, governance over, overseeing over, like he would need rangers to enforce his law in the, you know, outskirts of his wilderness. And so he, like ranger is a role that many lords and kings would need fulfilled and they would be hiring people. And so you could be a ranger just you, in between jobs, like a lordless ranger who knows that you know, he has all the skills and abilities to work for it or he trade for it and he is seeking employment and he could become an adventurer on his own, but he is a ranger because this is what he's done or this is what he's trained to do and it is focused on surviving, traveling and dealing with the dangers of wilderness and forest. This is, this is the ranger. And when you think about that, man, one of the most iconic and useful roles of an adventurer is definitely a ranger for what they can do. And so it's pretty cool. But now that we have a pretty good understanding of what a ranger really is, all right, what would be the best weapons for them to use to fill their duties? Not, and not only that, just the tasks that they need to be trained and equipped to do. So I already gave that absolutely, right? The bow, got caught on them, is definitely best pick, all right? It makes so much sense that the ranger would use a bow. Though, there is a, uh, a bit of an elephant, all right, in regards to uh, the bow, okay? And it's its size and inconvenience. If a ranger needs to travel through wilderness, a really, like something that's really, really big actually is a more of a detrimental issue than not. But I think you'd be willing to uh, accept some of the inconvenience of a really large bow for uh, its usefulness, okay? Because if you need to hunt food to survive, 
bow is the best way. I mean, trapping in other ways, of course, is, is to get by, but definitely a bow and arrows is one of the best ways and best survival tools for getting food as you travel through the wilderness. And so it makes complete sense that one of the classic and most iconic weapons of a ranger is a bow. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a war bow. This is the issue, it depends on what they're fighting. If a ranger only is using a bow for hunting, a war bow might not really fit. If you're in, an, if you're in a fantasy setting, I think it always be, needs to be war bow category because of the monsters that you would run uh, come across. But the thing is though, just because a ranger would be using his bow, you know, as his main survival tool, doesn't necessarily mean they would always be better archers than any other role or class in this world setting, okay? Military archers, it's a bit of a complex kind of discussion there because there is a debate on as to how accurate military war bow archers needs to be when you're shooting with hundreds or even thousands of other archers at an oncoming enemy force. I reckon that they definitely need a certain level of accuracy to just hone in on the target you want, especially if you need to aim for open parts of the armor. Or, but you know, if you're just aiming for the horse, much larger target. But definitely, you're not going to be shooting blind. Having said that, though, the ranger's use of a bow would usually be more target oriented than, say, large scale warfare archery. And so perhaps it does make sense that rangers would be naturally better archers than a lot of other character classes and roles. They could be considered the best archers in your entire world. Makes sense, especially if they train so much with it. Now, as to the type of bow, I think it would actually be more convenient, even for a, like a woodland ranger, to have, as much as it hurts, a smaller bow, not in not in power. You can actually get pretty compact bows made out of multiple materials, combination of horn and other things like that, that are pretty compact and smaller, but still pack a massive punch, okay? And so the classic medieval longbow isn't the only high poundage bow in human history. But in terms of uh, medieval inspired settings, the war bow is the classic European medieval bow, the long bow, sorry. And, uh, and so it depends on how you want to balance it with your fantasy. You can just say this fantasy setting, they have more complicated made bows that are more compact, made out of multiple materials, layered and things in different designs. And rangers would then, if they're available, I think they would almost favor those type of bows because they are more convenient. But as I have been able to show, you know, even in this, is that you can definitely, yeah, let me just get that in, um, uh, carry even a longbow in a much more convenient way. And it's just on hand, grab it out when you need it. So you can definitely make a longbow work. <laughs> just to say that they're too inconvenient, no. There'd be a level of inconvenience, but you can definitely manage it. But then we come to melee weapons, okay? Because sometimes they close the distance and a bow is not an effective melee weapon at all. So a ranger definitely needs a melee weapon to use. Now, I really think, like just looking at this practically and logically, whatever melee weapon they use, they're gonna want it to be practical and functional in as many uses as possible. Now, when you're traveling through the wilderness, there is some clear uses of certain bladed implements. If you're gonna be, you know, in the wilderness, you need to light a fire, you need to get wood. Okay, so dealing with wood, but also what if you're traveling through really thick wilderness? Let me show you an example. So one of the uh, very common things that you're gonna have to deal with as a ranger traveling through, and this would even be as adventurers, but if the adventuring party has a ranger in their group, this would kind of be their role. And it's dealing with really, really thick bush, you know, bracken or whatever. And look at this. This is what I have in one of the corners here in the Shadlands. And this is, you know, an example of some of the type of really, really thick wilderness that you might run into and you need to deal with. So I'm gonna walk up and come and have a close look at how thick this is. It's basically a wall of just bushes and crap. And so you're traveling, it's like, oh, ah, okay, ah, uh, so, the dungeon and or dragon's lair is through this. Now, you could try and push through it and you're only gonna get so far. Let's see how far we can get into this without 
getting too stuck. Ah, uh, ah, uh, where's that goblin guy? Already I'm getting stuck on all this crap, okay? Ah, uh, I. Uh, it's, it's cording on. So, all right, all right, hang on, hang on. Oh, crap. Take the ball off. Let's see if I can make better progress with the ball off. Okay. Ah. 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 So look at this. Go through here, right? This would be an absolute. Oh, what an annoyance to try and get through, okay? So. You could try and push through with difficulty, and it depends on how much time you have, all right? But if you know you need to travel along this path a decent amount, you're gonna to wanna to clear the way, all right? And this is where the tool or weapon you have is gonna be really important. And especially if you have like a pack animal or horse, okay? They're much taller and crouching down to get underneath all this crap. So if you have a pack animal or a horse, even if it's only a one way that you intend to go, you're really gonna need a clearer path. It's almost a necessity now. So, what would be good at getting through this? Now, rangers have a couple of iconic melee weapons. Aragon, for instance, uses the longsword. And perhaps if you had a longsword on your side, it wouldn't get in the way when you're getting through it, but I mean, I had to be holding my bow to get through that because it was just sticking up too high. But for clearing material like this, this is the reality, right? A sword, depending on its type, is not a good pick. Okay, so if I grab my really big, you know, it's either a really long, long sword or a smallish kind of great sword. Um, I call it a war sword this, this size. This one's my blunt one, so I can't show you how ineffective this one is. But there's actually a really big problem when it comes to big swords like this, when you're trying to chop resistant material, wood being a big one. And it's the, in, the inefficient transferal of force. This was surprising, and it's not intuitive. You think big sword, a lot more weight, chop through a lot easier. That can be detrimental for a cutting capacity when you get to swords of long sword size and greater. And not many people actually kind of realize this. It's not to say that these weapons are inefficient in combat. Against a person, the extra reach and range, really, really useful. And when you're hitting, you know, areas that you know are a bit more squishy, it's fine. But when you hit a really resistant material, this isn't resistant, let's pretend it was. Say this is like a really thick branch or something and I hit it, okay, when you hit something, the top of the sword still has a large amount of momentum. And I actually have another, you know, version of this sword where I did some destruction testing, just trying to chop it into a log. I could not chop the sharp version of this sword into the log. And I tried multiple times, and I was honestly shocked by it, where I had a much smaller sword-like thing, a machete, chopped, got in it, not a problem at all. And I found that amazing. And what that actually meant is that the machetes had a far more efficient transfer of force into the target than compared to the sword. And in actual fact, the transfer of force became so inefficient when I hit down on this log, right, that not only did it, get, it not get stuck in, it actually bent the blade. It bent because when I hit down, there was so much momentum in the top part of the blade that when it, this part hit the log, but this part bent down slightly, actually bent that way, because there was so much high momentum. Now, if all that weight of the sword was concentrated on the part that actually hit the log, it would have sunk in not a problem. But the problem is the weight wasn't concentrated in that spot. It was much further up, which put the point of inertia different. So when it hit, this part of the blade wanted to keep moving, but it wasn't being braced by anything, and it bent the blade and damaged it. Swords like this are not made to cut wood, which makes them uniquely inefficient at getting through brush like this. Because you might think, oh, something like that, easy. But there are parts in this bushland, especially down low around here, where the wood is a lot thicker, and this is not an efficient or good tool 
to cut through this brush. So then you might be thinking, well, the best weapon that can also function as a tool to get through wilderness would be an ax. I disagree, actually. The ax is great for splitting wood and chopping down trees, you're not going to be chopping down trees to clear brush, okay? And there is a problem, like an axe absolutely would be able to chop through any number of these branches. Just to give you an exa example here, not a problem, okay? So we can definitely through that. So an axe can definitely do the job, but there are some drawbacks. One, it's very top heavy, so every repeated swing is going to take a lot of energy. That's really great when you want to fell a tree because you need a heap of energy, but not necessarily for cutting through brush and all this and stuff, you know? So there's that, I like just pull you back up, it takes an effort. Then there is the cutting ratio. If you accidentally miss a cut and you hit on the shaft, You've wasted your swing and you just need to do it all over again. And so there is a tool that is also a weapon that does everything that you need to do. And that is the machete. And I'm not kidding, okay? With the right type of one, it is actually like machetes are orders of magnitude better at cutting through brush than anything else. And the cutting ratio, anything along there, is going to do the job. Now, the axe was uniquely inconvenient just cutting a branch before. Cutting this thing here. Compare it to this. First, let me finish that one off. But if I wanted to get through this, okay. Now, I make sure everything's out of the way. So if I want to get through this, all right, and I'm going to cut. And... So, first of all, come close. See how deep that one cut got on the tree. Depending on how good your swing is, um, and I've been clearing brush on my property with this very machete, I can get through stuff this thick in two swings. That was one. If I get a really good swing next, I'll get through it, but I doubt I will, because when you're doing it on camera, you always miss. But So that was four. But it's only because it took until the fourth swing to hit me to hit on the right spot part. But this, and I've been using it, is incredibly efficient at clearing brush. So a couple of days ago, I was here in the Shetlands needing to clear some brush. Why do I need to clear some brush? I needed access to the border of the property, specifically the fence line. Yet all this junk, all of that is in the way. So I had to put my good old machete to work. Let's see how far it'll sink in on a cut like this, ready? Holy crap! Did you see that? It's almost all the way through! That's insane! That is easily halfway through that branch. And seriously, it can sink so deep in because of look at how thin this blade is. Oh. Vicious. So I'm going to try and get a wedge now. Chop off that wedge. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Holy. That's two cuts. Three cuts to get through a branch that friggin' thick. <laughs> that is one cut. Like, that's one cut. So this is the path that I cleared with this machete here. So a machete is, in my opinion, by far the most useful tool for what a ranger would need to do if he's traversing thick wilderness, especially if he has to clear any type of brush out of his way, trailblazer path for perhaps a pack horse or just himself. Uh, so absolutely. But the thing is though, is the machete a medieval weapon? There is another medieval weapon that is often compared to a machete because of its similarities. And there's a bit of a discussion to be had as to the comparison between this weapon and a machete. Are they the same? Are they different? And the weapon I'm referring to is the falchion. Now, 
the machete I'm holding right here is actually surprise, the blade shape is surprisingly similar to that of many classic style falchion shapes. Thing is though, falchion is actually a collection of different blade shapes and one of the identifying things, single edged, usually curved, not always, but the blade edge curves, and the hilt construction specifically is that of a sword. So if I was to replace this blade with a standard cruciform hilt construction, could you call it a falchion? Well, it depends very much on the actual geometry of the blade, because there are a lot of machetes in the world that are not made to be used as combat weapons. They're thicker, uh, their balance is off, and it'll be an incorrect comparison to consider that a proper falchion. Yet what's interesting about this machete right here is that looking at the blade geometry of itself, it's actually very similar to that of a falchion with a couple of differences, but I think it would definitely be close enough. Here is a cutlass, but the interesting thing about this cutlass is it has very much a sword blade on it, and if I was to replace the hilt with a you know, cruciform hilt, this would be a falchion by definition. And just for the difference between falchion and mesa, if the hilt construction was that of a knife with a full tang, even with the exact same blade geometry, this would be a mesa by definition. Uh, a lot of falchion and mesa blades are identical, the difference being the hilt construction. Now, looking at this blade right here, it's actually very similar in terms of its cross section to this machete. The blade thickness, looking at the thickness right here, is one to one and a half mil thick. It's the same with this. Now, at, this one has a fairly pronounced primary bevel going along the edge. It's actually quite the same here. There's a bit more tapering on this one going down from there to there, but only slightly. The main bevel, okay, kicks in around here, but it just curves in gradually so you can't see it so distinctly as compared to this. That's one of the big differences between machetes and uh, actual sword blades and falchions is the actual tapering of the blade. If it has a distal taper going from the base down to here and the amount of tapering that goes from the spine to the edge. Okay, And tapering is how it angles down and in. And there is a certain amount of tapering coming in here but most of it happens right at the edge. Still, not every sword blade has distal taper. This one has the, only the slightest amount. This one doesn't. Machetes aren't really concerned with that level of specific sword geometry, but not every sword was either, okay? And so if I was to put a cruciform hilt on this blade, I think very rightly it would be considered a falchion. For that reason, all right, and now I'm not talking about every single machete could just change the hilt and then it would be a sword. By definition, kind of, but the blade wouldn't be optimized. For instance, this one here, even though it's now damaged, is much thicker than either of these blades. One of the key defining features of a falchion blade, certain types, is how remarkably thin the blade is, which is why this machete, I think, can so well qualify for a falchion because it actually conforms to so many parameters and design features of a falchion blade, and that's its thinness. But that is also why this machete cuts so dang well. The blade is so thin, it's only like one and a half mils thick, where this one, on average, is at least two mil to three mil at different points. And I've tested this one and it cuts like garbage. But when compared to this one, this one, its cutting capacity is brilliant. And I've put it well to the test, all the way down there. And so, this means, in my mind, that easily the most effective and efficient melee weapon for a ranger specifically is a falchion or mesa, which is of course made as a sword, but has the design features of a blade that are efficient, effective, optimized enough to be able to chop through brush. I mean, have a look at all the damage that I did through this woodland here, all with this one. Um, if I remember, this one only took like one and two cuts to get through. Really, really efficient. And so it means you have a very effective sword. Falchions and mesa blades are deadly, specifically cutting through cloth armor. Falchions specifically because of how thin 
And then you have a phenomenal practical tool that helps you deal with so many issues that a ranger specifically would deal with more often. Actual fact, adventurers in general, but a ranger is more optimized for the type of terrain that adventurers would have to face quite regularly. Unless, of course, they're, you know, the soft adventurers that just travel on roads. Pfft, weak. It was well known historically how devastatingly effective falchions and messes were at cutting. And their design was very much optimized for it. Remember how I said, you know, classically, falchion blades are actually very, very thin? Like, look at how thin this blade is, right? And some are so, f some, like, actual ones that survive from the period, right, are so thin that there are holes that have rusted through on the flat of it because they've been that thin. That's how, like, crazy thin some of these blades are. And we are talking, like, sometimes a millimeter thin. And because they're so thin, right, they, there is less material that needs to be pushed apart when they cut, which is one reason why they cut so efficiently. But there's another profoundly effective design feature on falchion blades, which this effectively is, okay, and it's the optimization and position of the weight. Look where there's a weight concentration on this. Remember the weakness I had with this two-handed sword chopping through wood? That there was too much weight away from the area that struck to the point where it bent? This is almost the reverse, where it concentrates weight on the striking area, so more force is delivered right into the target with less damage being done to the blade itself. And when I tried to chuck this, blade into the same bit of wood I was trying to chop my two-handed sword into. This sunk into it and got stuck in it, not a problem, because it's thinner and the weight opt optimization was better. And this is the hot take. This is an insanely good cutter as a result. So much so, it's better at cutting than many other famous cutting-like swords. I would put money that this blade right here can cut through wood and brush, and you might think this is obvious, but would cut through wood and brush like this more efficiently and easier than a katana would. And the katana is famed for its cutting capacity, okay? Now, it's a great cutter for a sword, yet it is not nearly as optimized as something like this. Look at the shape, okay? This is optimized, concentrating the weight exactly where you need it, as shown in European history, okay? It's a devastating cutter and was used by knights. Okay, it wasn't actually wholly a peasant weapon. It was actually, seems to be more favored by higher, more wealthy people, because a lot of the surviving falchions we have have really fancy hilts, okay, and uh, were well, quite expensive, must have been because of how they're made, and the adornments on them. And so, absolutely, knights and higher-ups used falchions, all right? And for all these reasons, this is such a great, amazing weapon. So imagine this is a falchion now, with an actual, you know, cruciform blade. This is a, such an amazing weapon for a ranger, which comes into an, another interesting element. It's better for it to be one-handed than two-handed to optimize, because if this gets too long, you're going to run into the same problem that uh, my, you know, uh, war sword happened into, where too much weight is away from the striking end. If you really want to get devastating cuts that concentrate on it, too long can actually be detrimental, depending on design. There's caveats there. But one-handed works better and more versatility and easy to get through brush because it's not getting caught on things like that. Sword has been getting caught on a decent amount. So... One-handed sword. Now the thing is though, if you actually go, for the tool, the normal uses, one-handed, all right, yeah, you'll only be using one at a time, yet when you get into combat, and you, and uh, you know, they got, they got in close, you can't use your longbow, and you have a one-handed weapon, you have a free hand, what do you use? Could you use a, um, a type of falchion or messer that has long enough handle to use two hands? Yeah, you could, there's that. Or, what about a shield? A shield's too cumbersome. Maybe a buckler? You could get away with just carrying a buckler, you know, buckler and falchion or messer. Or two falchion messers. This is where actually dual wielding might be a more appropriate and functional pick than other weapons, which is usually dual wielding is seen as a novelty that isn't done a lot. Historically, that was the case, and it's not really for the battlefield, because in the battlefield, if you've got a free weapon, you're going to be using a shield, or you have enough armor to warrant two-handed weapons. But for a ranger, a two-handed weapon is more detrimental to the function of just getting through the bushland. And so one-handed weapons, well, and then two weapons. And this is the crazy thing. I never thought I'd come to this conclusion. One of the classic iconic styles that are associated with the ranger in Dungeons and Dragons is dual wielding. I can't believe that we've naturally come to that same conclusion 
just through a logical analysis of the core base functionality of what the most appropriate weapons as tools as well would be for a ranger. But as to the, like it's dual wielding, which is crazy the same, but the type of weapon, the type of sword specifically, would be one that you could use essentially as a machete to get through bush as well, which would be a falchion or messer. Dual wielding falchions or messers would be one of the best picks for the fantasy ranger, the most functional. And this is talking about melee. Of course, the bow is the king, king of all. Okay, the bow is the main weapon for the ranger. But then when it comes to melee, I dual wielding, and yet not everyone needs a dual wield, you got the buckler thing. But I think dual wielding, falchion and messers, <laughs> it works like surprisingly well. And uh, d and got it right. I'm not sure they got it, they picked that for the functional reasons we've been able to discover in this video. I think it's like, rangers need an iconic thing. Uh, blah, 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 dual wielding, yeah, let's do it. Now we've actually come to it justifiably and logically, I can't believe it. Here we go. So, rangers, much more appropriate, much more functional just for the fantasy setting than I gave it credit to in the past, and the best weapons and equipment for them. There we go. Thank you very much for watching. I do hope you have enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you here on the next video on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell.